Hello, mental workers, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am elated to have with me Matthew Jackson. Hi, Matt. Hi. It's so nice to have you on. And listeners, we've got Matthew on today for a listener story. So they're going to share with you their insights, their journey to registration, some hiccups they had along the way and some successes that they had. Specifically, we're going to be touching on, and this is a spoiler, but Matthew did a clinical bridging program and they left it. And then another thing is that they're going to speak to us about being authentically you within therapy. And I'll let them take that one away when we get to it. But we've got some really exciting things coming up here. So I'm really excited, Matthew. Thank you. Me too. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. No, it's such a pleasure to have you on. So let's get straight stuck into it. So I want to paint you a picture, Matthew. It's of you and it's 2019 and you've just finished your plus one year of the five plus one program and you've gotten your general registration and you are feeling burnt out beyond belief. Tell us what happens next. Oh, (laughs) Uh, I think what happened next was uh, that like inner saboteur just kicked in that like perfectionism that we all have as therapists that I know you've spoken about before just kicked in and was like, hey, why don't you just like keep going? Why don't you just like dig the hole deeper and deeper? Just just suck it up. So that's what I did. Wow. So a real you just love the self-punishment. Yeah, it, it 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 just activated, right? And uh, instead of being able to like celebrate uh, this huge accomplishment of you know finishing uni, finishing masters, and then the plus one degree as it is, instead of celebrating that, it was more like, okay, so now what? Now what achievement do I look towards? Now now what do I base my self worth off of if I've completed my masters? Now what? Wow. So would you describe yourself as a perfectionist? Um, I feel like that's an understatement. I would love a different (laughs) word. I still haven't found the word that perfectly describes what I experienced. And at the same time, perfectionism is a really good description for it. Yeah. Oh, you poor thing. It sounds like it was exhausting. It was exhausting. I feel like um, it's been four or five years down the track now and I'm only now just repairing that burnout. So it has been exhausting. Wow. Thank you for the validation. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, because having done the 5 plus 1 program myself, it's it's such an exhausting program. I mean, you do the national psychology exam, you have to get all the hours, all the supervision hours, and then amongst that you have to do all the paperwork. It's, it's such an exhausting process. And to the, be at the end of that and then think to yourself, oh, I have to keep going. It's like, damn. Yes. (laughs) That's the exact response. (laughs) Wow. So what prompted you to then do the bridging program? I think there was two reasons. I think the first reason was that the perfectionism kept uh, telling me, kept communicating to me that I didn't know enough and that that must be because my, my knowledge wasn't good enough that I needed to know more. Uh, And I think the second reason was, um, quite honestly, peer pressure. I think I had listened to a lot of clinical psychs uh, within the field who uh, were communicating to me that if I I wanted to stay in this career and uh, if I wanted to kind of be good at it, that I needed to be a clinical psych. So both of those two things conjointly uh, sort of forced me in a way to to follow the bridging program avenue. Wow. And was that something you had considered before doing the five plus one? Uh, no. <laughs> I think for me, the goal was essentially just to work with humans. It was just to work with people. Yeah. Whether that was like psychology or not, psychology was just the door that opened. Uh, but it was just to work with humans. So clinical was never actually part of my my goals. It was never actually something for me to achieve. Uh, and yet I found myself on that pathway of like, yeah, I, I think this is what I want. I'm being told this is what I have to do. So I'm going to go along with it. That's what I'm going to do. Wow. That's really interesting that it, it just wasn't even on your radar, it seems. And then it's through a combination of being like, wow, really, I really feel like I don't know enough. Plus other people being like, well, I guess I'm interested to know, did they state directly that you won't be able to make it as a general psych or was it implicit or did you read it or how did you, how did you learn this? 
So it was definitely said to me. I think there was implicit writings, um, you know, from those kind of higher up organisations. <laughs> Uh, and then there was definitely conversations that I'd had with clinical psychs uh, where the message was quite, yeah, explicitly, quite bluntly that in order to remain a psychologist, because, you know, general will probably be wiped out one day. So to remain a psychologist, you need to be clinical and um, to be like taken seriously and to have the clientele, like you need to be clinical. The clinical are the best. They're the smartest, that very kind of hierarchical uh, discussion, I guess, occurred. And so that was, yeah, what was said specifically to me. Yeah. So it just seemed to you hearing and listening to that. And I guess wanting to listen to people who had more experience than you in the field that you were like, oh, okay, well this, this must be the next thing to do. Yes, completely. And I think that's actually like one of the major components here, right? Is that I had just finished the five plus one, like master's was done a year ago. I've just finished the plus one hours and experience the national psychology exam, as you said, and I'm kind of looking for the next thing because my perfectionism is telling me that's what I meant to do. And then here comes this message of like, yeah, you're definitely not good enough as a general. The the best thing to be is clinical. <laughs> so yeah. I- <laughs> sucks when you say it like that out loud, doesn't it? It's like you've demonstrated all of these competences and like really dragged your feet through the mud and come out the other side only to be told that you're still not good enough. Like, ouch. Yeah, compl- I think my perfectionism was like, that's really tasty. We should we should remember that for a long time to come. That fits in with my life experiences. I'm going to hold on to that one and discard our other evidence. Very that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so, unfortunately. Oh, so we've got burnt out and feeling inadequate, Matthew, here. And then you start the, I mean, you apply for the clinical bridging program and then you gain entry into it. And I'm curious to know, what were your expectations of the program going into it? Great question. So uh, my expectations were that I was going to learn something that I hadn't learnt from my first master's and that I hadn't learned from the plus one, that I was going to learn something magical that, you know, I, there was something missing. Like I'd been told there was something missing and that this clinical Avenue was the only way that I was going to learn it. It was just this like magical thing. Um, And so that was my expectation that I'm going to finally learn this thing and then I'm going to be good and I'm going to be great and successful and not disposable and feel great about myself. That was my expectation. Okay. So what happened when you encountered reality? Did it match up with that expectation or was it different? I'm laughing when you say reality. I love that. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're accurate. It's so accurate. You're so right. Um, it was completely disparate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, f- I found myself uh, actually at the end of the course, I compared uh, my unit marks with the unit marks of my first master's. And, uh, of course my, my marks were better. I had already, um, I just done the plus one and another master's. So my marks were, you know, gradually a bit better. Uh, but the thing that stuck out for me the most was that I'd done the exact same classes, quite, quite literally the exact same classes. And I hadn't realized in the moment, I, I think I was, convincing myself that, oh, no, I'm totally learning something different about depression. And I, yeah, no, I mustn't have known that about CBT. No, that must be new. Uh, But in actual fact, I I had learned the same things and that the only thing that I learned that was different was about schema therapy. Otherwise, everything else matched. Like, yeah, grade for grade. (laughs) You you look quite shocked when you you say that. Oh. (laughs) I mean, was it shocking to you when you realized that like, okay, I've just done the same thing? I would say shocking, yes, disappointing. Oh. I would say um, maybe like kind of infuriating. Oh. And I don't know if that was just the, you know, initial emotion. Maybe there was, you know, kind of other emotions going on underneath that. It was might have been an iceberg effect. But I definitely remember thinking back, no, I feel disappointed and I feel infuriated that uh, I've engaged in a, a year-long process and have another year to go. I did it part-time. 
and I am a, a lot in debt now. <laughs> and uh, I haven't actually learned anything besides schema therapy. I haven't actually learned anything new. That's actually very disappointing. And I'm really angry at myself for getting myself into this position. What am I doing here? So yeah, definitely shocked. And I think disappointing uh, as well. Yeah. It would have been kind of heartbreaking actually, like to have those expectations and then go in and then realizing like, I've learned nothing new here, except for a very minute piece of information that I could have gotten through other professional development outside of this course. Oh, completely. And, you know, if I'm honest, I took a break from psych. Wow. I kind of, I stepped back. I did. I took a step back from psychology and actually asked myself, what am I doing? What is psychology? I I don't even understand this now because I've done two courses and one's meant to be, you know, better in knowledge and experience, but it's been the same. Wait, what even does a psychologist do then? I'm so lost. So I took a little break from psychology for a very short period of time. It was like two months, I think. Uh, and then was like, yeah, so I've, I've kind of got bills to pay. <laughs> and if I'm honest, I also really missed quite a few of my clients yeah. um, and, and kind of threw myself back in. Uh, and then, you know, I had a whole nother journey that came from that, but kind of coming back. Yeah. It was very like, wait, this isn't what I was expecting. This wasn't the plan. What is psychology? What am I doing here? So it really caused you to stop and reflect on where you were going and what you're doing. Correct. Yeah. I had to, yeah, I had to stop and actually like kind of go internal that like introspective work. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And yeah, really figure out like beyond just like being a psych, how does this profession actually work and how do I want to work within it? I'm curious to know because I'm actually one of these people, like if I start something, then I finish it, no matter the personal cost. It's maladaptive. It's actually not healthy. It it sounds like you went against the grain here. I'm wondering, could you take us through what it took for you to be like, nope, I'm out? Oh, Great question. Uh, I noticed my heart race for a moment then. (laughs) Um, It took a lot. I feel like that's um, like in summary, a lot. (laughs) Yeah. But to get even to get even more specific, of course, it took countless. I, I don't even know how many conversations I had to have with myself that were really blunt, that were probably kind of bordering on too honest. And had to really put my perfectionism in check, that that version of me, uh, and really kind of communicate to him, uh, you're not going to win in this. Like, you're not. This is not going to be good for us if we just continue this. If we just, you know, uh, what's that saying? Like, white knuckle it, like yeah. tear down and yeah. just finish it. This is not going to be good. We're, we're already done. We're already burnt out. We're hanging on a thread. We even took a break from psych for a tiniest little period. Um, do you really think this is going to be good for us? Come on now. So it was like a lot of conversations with myself. I had to really reach out to friends who are not in the psych field. No, oh. no, no psych at all. I found that, um, and I love all my psych friends. Love you if you're listening. Um, <laughs> I love them. I do really love them. But the message I was getting was don't give up. And it was like, yeah, but that's what my perfectionism is telling me. That's not what I need you to tell me. <laughs> so I needed somebody who was the opposite side of the coin. And I had to kind of like become that person away from friends and family and colleagues. I had to like push myself beyond um, my own like schemas to become that person. It was a lot. It, it, it sounds lot. like quite an intense process. So are you saying that people even within your circle were saying, Matt, don't give up? Yes. Wow. Even, um, yes, even non-psych friends who I've been friends with for a decade um, who know me, you know, quite well uh, were saying to me, but that's not you. And I'm like, yes, I, I hear what you're saying. And at the same time, I think there's kind of a new me that's wanting to come through. So how do we let that happen? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That sounds so intense to, yeah, have people who I'm sure like well-intentioned, they love you very much to be like, look, Matt, don't give up, but you can do this. And you're like, I know I can do this, but is it good for me to do this? Exactly. 
And I think quite honestly, um, the only person was probably my mum, uh, my like my my bestest friend, my like, you know, biggest supporter out yeah. in the world. I think she was probably the only person to go, do you know what? I'm hearing you and you just do whatever you want and I'll back you. So I, I think like, yes, I had to push myself beyond measure and I, I really was looking for permission. Like most, most of us are, I think I was looking for permission to like get that final push to listen to myself. And it was nice in reflection. It was nice to have it from, from my mum to, you know, kind of go, I'm hearing you, you do your thing. Props to mum. <laughs> Yeah. Mums rock. Don't even get me started on mums. They're the best. <laughs> and so you really wanted to listen to yourself. And then after that, you were like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen to me. I did. I, uh, I took the leap. It was like a huge leap for me. And I decided, I, I even remember the day. It was a Tuesday. It was 10 a.m. I remember the day and time. It was that significant. <laughs> It was a Tuesday at 10 a.m. I was sitting there. Um, of course, listeners can't see where I pointed. Uh, the sun was shining through my window. I remember it really vividly. And I remember saying, this is it. I've, I'm, I'm done. I'm killing the shell. I'm making the decision and I'm, I'm, I'm out. Mm. <laughs> it's done. Wow. And how did you feel after? Oh, I, I, I don't know if I could even um, give you a comparison of the relaxation I felt throughout the top half of my body. Mm. Um, I, I don't think a massage has, ev- like has ever given me that form of relaxation. Just to give myself that permission and final, like, just trust yourself was like, oh, yes. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. I'm really proud of you for doing that. Well done. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a really big thing. It's no no like of course you would remember it because it's so significant and it sounds like it took like a lot of straight talking to yourself and a lot of listening to other people but then coming back to yourself to be able to make that choice. And it sounds like it was the right decision for you given like how, you know, your body told you that okay, we can relax now. Completely agree with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I don't regret it one bit. My life uh, and uh, my career within psychology has completely changed and I genuinely couldn't be happier. So I do not regret that decision one bit. So what about all the other psychs who are telling you, you know, you can't succeed as a general psych, you know, you're inadequate and inferior to them. What do you think of that now? Do you know what? I'm still in contact with a few of them. <laughs> I I am. Yep. And I I watch them and I listen to them and I observe them and I don't know if they're truly like happy. They they kind of look burnt out and it's really interesting to kind of watch the dynamic shift between me and and those people who kind of pushed me into following the clinical path. The dynamics different. I'm more bubbly and charismatic and I'm I'm very energetic because I'm not burnt out. And it's, it's sad that um, a, a lot of those uh, clinical people who had kind of advised, pushed are the complete opposite. They were me years ago. It's really interesting to watch. That is super interesting. And I'm really pleased to hear that you're not burnt out anymore. And there is such a stark difference when you look at people who are burnt out just in general um, compared to people who are not. And it's just, you know, when you're burnt out, we've talked about it before on the podcast, but it can really suck the enjoyment out of everything. And you're just very tired and, and exhausted and you really feel like you just can't keep going. Yeah. It's almost like the profession becomes almost like a demon or something. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. It's like it becomes this demon. Yeah, this like demon on your shoulder that's like, uh, uh. <laughs> So just before we wrap up this section and we go into the next section, I just want to ask you, so if there's any listeners who are listening and they are thinking of doing a bridging program, the clinical bridging program, what would you say to them? Listen to yourself. Listen to that gut feeling. If you feel like um, this bridging program or any program that you do, any workplace, whatever it might be, is not right for you, listen to that. That's that inner you, you know, screaming like, no. (laughs) So listen to it. Listen to them. They're your friend. Yeah. (laughs) Don't tell them to shut up and like put a sock in their mouth. No, no more like, you know, white knuckling it. Listen to yourself. Mm, Beautiful. Thank you. 
Matthew, I really want to turn to, I guess, like having come through this experience, you mentioned that you're very happy now in your practice and what you're doing. So could you tell us just what you are doing? Like, you know, which populations do you work with? Which setting are you working in? What What's your passion in psychology? Yeah. So uh, I work in uh, two different places or settings. I, I work in a hospital and I also work in a private practice. Um, so I get kind of two different forms of psychology, I guess you could say. Uh, I do a lot of kind of individual work as well as group work. And that's always nice to have that sort of balance. I predominantly work within the population of personality disorders, as well as the areas of things like grief, um, gender, sexuality. Uh, Those tend to be my main areas of interest and kind of work with people across um, the age spectrum, uh, across everything, actually. And you mentioned to me that you're really passionate about being authentic in therapy. Could you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So I think uh, one of the things that I realized recently that was going to help um, after listening to your episode on the longevity in psychology, <laughs> um, my, my takeaway of that was uh, what's going to help me be me both outside and inside the therapy space. And so I'm extremely passionate for uh, psychologists, uh, therapists, to be authentically them, to be true to themselves whilst they're consulting with a patient. I am an openly queer person myself. I love being part of the queer community. I love being a a queer individual. Um, And uh, you will usually find me in a therapy room with like multiple queer badges on my shirt. (laughs) I don't shy away from it. Love it. Yeah. And it's extremely important for me uh, not only just day to day, but in regards to the longevity of of this career for me, to be 100% myself, to be um, a queer person, and to be this, you know, effervescent bubbliness individual within the space. So yeah, it's really important to me that um, therapists are them within the space. Yeah, I can really see you light up when you talk about it. It's really obvious that it's like, yeah, you love being queer, you love being queer individual, queerness is great. Yeah. Yeah, cool. totally. Good message. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, has it always been this way? Have you always been openly queer as in your role as a psychologist or did something happen to like prompt that openness? So the answer to that is no. I used to hide um, my, my queerness, my, my queer power. I used to hide that away. I was informed uh, by a, a colleague at the very beginning of my career that in order to be a successful psych, I had to have two different personalities. One was like me, and then the other one was this psychologist personality who was not queer, who didn't, you know, move their hands and who wasn't, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, bubbly and, you know, speaks kind of loudly and stuff. Um, I was told that that just isn't what a psychologist is. And uh, I was kind of that for a period of time. I have also worked with uh, colleagues as well as with patients who have made homophobic slurs to me, quite literally to my face. Um, and I'm, I'm laughing because it's, you know, traumatic. Uh, and uh, I guess it kind of, all those experiences culminated uh, around the same time of the previous discussion and uh, culminated in this result of like, yeah, I'm going to be me though. I actually don't, I don't care if you don't like that I'm gay. That's not my problem. I'm going to be like even super gay. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I'm really sorry you experienced those homophobic experiences because obviously everyone deserves to feel safe at work. And, you know, I can only imagine um, how horrible it was to experience that. It was horrific. Um, In part, I quite generally thought about leaving psychology for good because it had happened quite a few times and I thought that maybe this just isn't the space for me. Maybe I can't be queer in psychology, uh, which is also a complete lie. (laughs) You can totally be queer in psychology and out and proud. Um, And I I find that the queer individuals who I do work with, uh, if I think specifically about queer patients or queer clients of mine, they blossom. 
the more that I um, show my queerness to them, the more that they blossom as an individual with their treatment goals. So um, I think there's something to be said here (laughs) about being authentically you. Yeah. What do you think, what's the effect that it has on them the more that you're yourself with, say, your queer patients? I think it's a few different things. I think one of the things um, as queer people is that we definitely learn, and especially from my generation uh, and generations back, we definitely learn that, uh, you know, it's not okay to be queer, shut it down. If you are in a space that is a heterosexual space, so perform to a heterosexual, heterosexual norm, you know, kind of present straight in other words. Um, And I did that for most of my life, most of my career, really. And I think then working within the the therapy space with clients, they get to see like, oh, wait, if my therapist is queer and is really proud of it and and talks about um, queer, queer things and queer phenomenon, queer events, queer culture, maybe it's okay for me to do it. I don't know but at least I get to explore it with them. So there's kind of like a normalizing, validating practice that occurs. Also, I think one of the things that happens is I'm I'm not, um, because I'm a queer person myself, I'm not scared to kind of go there with queer clients who, who might need that person who's like, hey, this is a safe space to be you. You don't, you don't need to pretend to be somebody else. Please be you. I promise uh, this is so cherished. You are so safe with me. Please be gay (laughs) or please be queer. (laughs) I think that's so beautiful. Yeah, it's so lovely to hear because, you know, quite often we do have clients, patients who come to us with a great deal of shame about who they are and they've been told various things like they're not good enough, they're not thin enough, they're not straight enough, like, you know, and they can come to us with that shame. So by seeing a therapist like yourself who is like, no, I'm proud to be me, uh, yeah, I can imagine it can be life-changing. Oh, a hundred percent. Even just thinking about um, within the gay community, specifically the the gay male community, body shaming. Oh, we could do a whole like two podcasts on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> the um, the uh, queer male presenting individuals that I work with. That's what we talk about in a lot of our sessions. Wow. Is is body shaming? Yeah. I'm um, even even down to like body hair. Oh, um, damn. And then. Yeah. And then I I work um, quite heavily as well within the trans community, my trans sisters, brothers, and uh, in between like envies. And uh, we explore things from like, how do you be trans and have a relationship? How does that even work? So yeah, I think that space is really like, hey, this is protective, um, 100%, please be you. Or, or even if you don't feel comfortable being you, um, it's okay to just like even just sit here and uh, we can kind of together sit with that acknowledgement that like we're part of the same community. Let's just leave that then. You know, we can kind of find a common ground. I kind of understand somewhat what they're going through. Yeah. Can you just take us through what it feels like? Because you said maybe for a few years you were separating that there's this professional self, which is kind of plain Jane, I don't bring myself to this space. And then you mm-hmm. then you made that decision to to be yourself. Like how does that change how you show up to work? Like what are the what are the benefits or the impact of that? Yeah. So um I definitely find uh as I mentioned, I guess kind of externally, I am not afraid to present as whoever I want to present as. So my my eyebrows are quite thin and I don't care what people think about it. Um, I I wear, you know, queer badges, I have pronoun badges, I have the queer flag. Um I kind of sw- uh, you know switch them up some here and there with different queer badges. Uh, and that's kind of my way of being like, I'm a safe place, you know, but I will be um, authentically me if I want to say something or move in a way, even if I just want to dance, I will do that. And um, that that's okay for me to do that. I can be that confident person. Uh, I think um, as well, and I'm, I'm kind of revealing a little secret here. You're getting a top secret thing about me now. Exclusive to this podcast. I'll put it in 
the show notes. <laughs> Ex- exclusive. Um, uh, there's like a sound effect with it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but by day, I am a uh, you know a, a psychologist, and I help people achieve their goals and with whatever they're going through. And then by night, I'm this like flashy rhinestone drag queen. So I get to kind of. Um, <laughs> I get to kind of bring in um, this queer power that I have as a drag queen into being a psychologist. And in doing that, I feel so like confident within myself, with confident within my um, ability that I, I don't feel um, like disconnected anymore. I don't feel like I need to pretend. I don't feel like I need to put on that mask and think, okay, I'm in a heterosexual space, be heterosexual think heterosexually. Good. You got it. Great. I would even lower my voice. Wow. Um, I'm not doing it now. I don't know if I could even do it again, but (laughs) I used to lower my voice. (laughs) Um, Yeah. It's just to kind of fit in with other psychs and that type of thing. Whereas now I I kind of bring in my, my drag persona a little bit and um, I get to use that with clients who are a bit maybe, you know, uh, kind of uncomfortable in therapy and I get to, you know, be a little bit jovial with them and you know, a little bit of reverent and um, in doing so, I feel so powerful as a psych. Wow. Like I don't have to go to that old me again. Oh, I love that. I love that for you. I'm so glad that you've been able to be yourself in this space because it really breaks my heart to hear that you considered leaving because it just didn't seem like queerness was welcome in this in this profession. But it's like, yeah, I'm so glad you, you now like, look, I'm making this space for me and I am welcome here. Completely. Actually, I really like the way you said that. I'm welcome here. I think that's my like huge takeaway to this is that I have um, carved a space for myself and hopefully, I really, really hope any other queer um, clinicians who I've worked with, including um, students who I've, who I've worked with in workplaces, I hope that I've um, kind of carved that space for them and, and they can bring in, you know, their own uh, drag power, their own queer power into it and, and be authentically them within psychology. That would mean the world to me. Oh, I hope so too. Yeah. And it sounds like you have, like just by being yourself and accepting that, it's a really, it's a really powerful big move. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. So I reckon that there are queer folk listening to this podcast who have heard you be mm. out and proud and authentically yourself. And they're like, wow, maybe this could be me. But they're kind of shaking in their boots and being like, are there any consequences to doing this? Like, you know, maybe they're feeling scared. What what would you say to those people? Great question. I would say to those people, first before anything, um, consult with you, right? No, no matter what I say here on this podcast or anybody else in the world, you are the only expert on you. And so um, please consult with you and, and your inner child on, you know, how, how much of your queer power or queerdom you want to display within the therapy space. Um, I would also uh, talk to talk to the queer community about it. You know, you um, if you're within the community, any queer friends you have, consult with them. We we get it. <laughs> so uh, consult with us on, or even you know, consult with me. I don't know, but consult with the queer community on uh, you know what that might look like for you being a queer authentic therapist. How could you do that? What are your boundaries? Right? Even ethically, what happens um, as a queer therapist, being in the queer community, having queer friends? What ethically, what are your boundaries? What what are you doing here? So um, consult with your queer community as well. Um, and I guess there's always, you know, supervision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of why it's there, right? Well, one of the reasons anyway. Um, you know, seek seek supervision. Um uh, and if, if your supervisor's not sure, seek queer supervision. I don't know if that's specifically a thing, but if I ever become a supervisor, I'm going to make it a thing. <laughs> that's going to be it. You should buy the web domain now, queersupervisor.com. <gasps> I'm on to it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go. I've got to get this done. No, um, <laughs> there's my perfectionism. Um, 
uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, uh, consult with your uh, supervisor as well and um, explore what that's like and what you want that to look like. And, again, those consequences that might pop up for you because they're there. They're def- they're, they are definitely there. I'm not going to lie. I've ran into my ethics issues already. They're there. <laughs> But it sounds like with like every, I guess, decision that we make in our professional lives, like there are going to be pros and cons. And for you, you've really seen that the pros have outweighed the cons of being authentically yourself. Completely. I think, you know, so many pros. The only con that would be anything is uh, running into a client uh, within a queer space in in drag, in my drag form, which I've already done. It's okay. already happened. How'd you deal with and, it? And um, I love that question. Do you know what I did? Um, I knew that I was going to run into this person. Um, I I understand, uh, having worked with this person for a good period of time now, um, that they are already heavily in the community. So in the first session, I, you know, kind of prerequisite um, uh, confidentiality as, you know, we're going to run into each other. But this will happen. I know it's going to. So how do you want to do it? Because this is what I'm thinking. And then when the event came up that we would run into each other, I said to them, so remember that thing I mentioned in the first session? I think it's going to happen this weekend. What do we do? What what do you want to do? Because you're going to see me in a different light and um, I I don't want you to feel uncomfortable. And I also don't want to feel uncomfortable what do we do here? And do you know what? We just came to a conclusion of how about we just smile at each other and we just keep walking. We don't, we don't stop, nothing out. Let's just do a little smile uh, and we just keep it moving. And, um, you know, we've had sessions since then and it's not been a problem. Amazing. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes people are just like, oh, my goodness, I couldn't bear to see my client out in public and I couldn't cope with it. But you know, the way you just put it then, it's like, okay, just collaborate with a client on what you're going to do. Like, assess, like, are you, what's the realistic pro- likelihood that you'll run into each other? Okay, it seems high. Let's figure out what we're going to do and enact the plan. Completely. I mean, for me, there's that realistic component, right, of, of the, the brain there kind of going, hey, it's going to happen. We can either freak out about it. Or we can we can just create a plan together. Yeah. We, this can be a collaborative approach. And also because I'm I don't want to I don't want to quit drag. I don't want to quit you know my queer authenticity. I don't want to avoid um, queer events just because I'm going to see clients there. Um, that that's not fair to me in my life. Um, and it's it's kind of not fair to my clients either. To I guess you know to like sh- shame them almost. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not okay. So um, for me, it's like, do you know what? Let's just tackle this head on. Let's show um, any clients that I've worked with, uh, queer clients that is, um, let's show them that we can handle this. We, we can do this together. And if it doesn't work out, if something happens next session, we'll work it out. We, we will figure this out together. This doesn't mean the end of our relationship and it doesn't mean the end of my career. Yes. It is fine and yeah. it's been totally fine for me. Great. Oh, so relieving to hear. And I really love what you've said there because I think the, I'm going to say old advice and I'm sure it's still being given out, but the old advice was that we really had to hide who we were outside of work. And oh. let's say if we were doing something that we loved doing photography and we had an Instagram photography account, it's like, shut it down. Like you cannot do that. And I've heard it for say sex work as well. Like you cannot be a sex worker yes. and a psychologist. And it's like you said, it's really unfair to that person yes. to have to yes. feel like they can't be who they are because um, they're yep. a person as well. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play that game. <laughs> yeah, nice. I think that's that's lovely. And it's like, you know, when I think about the consequences for you, like if you had to be, say, not who you are, it sounds like you were unhappy. Like it wasn't you. I did it for years, years, and I hated life. Yeah. I think that's no good. Um, Like, you know, therapists who hate life, like they're not having a great time and, you know, they might find it difficult to show up for their clients in the way that they really want to as well. Yeah. Do you know what? I was, I had, um, I pushed down my queer power so deep that I was uncomfortable around my own community. Mm, That's sad. Like, what? 
Like, I, what? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. It should be the opposite, right? And so um, I, I know the listeners couldn't see me before, but when you were talking, I was reacting. <laughs> <laughs> there were strong reactions there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You saw me. I was like, no, 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 this thing. Um, no, I, I do not play that game. For me, um, you know, life is not Monopoly. Um, or that's probably trademarked. You probably can't keep that one in. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> it's not a board game. We are we are therapists. We are humans first, though, and we get to have a life outside of psychology. And if we just, you know, um, play by the rules, play by ethics, protect ourselves, protect our clients, protect the community, we do no harm. Then what's the problem? Be gay, be be drag, be be a sex worker, be authentically you. You have my permission to be authentically you. I'm very passionate about this. I'm getting, I'm moving all over the place. You are very passionate, but I completely agree. I'm just like, preach. Yep. <laughs> Endorsed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to start like a new wave um, a church where it's just psychologists or, or any allied health workers who just come in and I just stand up once a week and I say, be you, only you. You know, I think that would be really popular. <laughs> Done. It's on. It's happening. Yeah. I think, I honestly think like there would be some psychologists who just like, are you showing up to Matthew's thing where he's going to tell us that, you know, we can be us? <laughs> oh, heck yes. I never miss a week. <laughs> uh, I love it. It would be so camp. Yeah, it would be, but it, it, it's great camp. Yes. Agreed. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> so. I think that I think hopefully this really speaks to and resonates with some listeners and just everyone really because you know whether or not you're queer it's like we've all got people yes. we're all humans first so it's like you know being authentically yes. yourself speaks to all of us. Yes, even um for all my um heterosexual buddies for all my allies. <laughs> Um, you know, you don't have to be queer to be authentically you, <laughs> be you, do, you know, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> but if you want to be queer, you can. <laughs> yes. If you're queer, even more stunning. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, I just wanted to ask you a bit more about your drag. Like, yes. just tell us a bit more about it. What's it do for you? Oh, I love this. This is kind of fun. I feel really <laughs> excited and loved. Um <laughs> So, uh, you know, my um, out of drag or government name, as we refer to it in drag, my government name is Matt uh, and my drag name is Matilda Mercury. Um, and it's kind of a play on, on my first name there a little bit. Also, because Mercury is my favorite planet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A little bit of a space nerd, a little bit of a, you know, one of those types of individual. Great. And I love drag. I um I do bingos, I do live shows, lots of hosting, does some corporate events, makes me feel very kind of luxe. Love the photo shoots. Um, now and then I love to just do a photo shoot for the sake of loving my body. Love it. It is so empowering to just stand there and say, this is me. And you know what? I'm going to love me as I am right now. So empowering, scary, terrifying and empowering. Wow. Inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. So I love drag. It's, I think it was, um, uh, even if I think back on my life, it, like I, I was dressing up in my mum's clothing when I was like five. So I think Matilda was always there and it, it's only really been because of these, um, like negative experiences within psychology that she was born. Wow. So <laughs> <laughs> they tried to squish you down, yeah. but she came out stronger. <laughs> And you know what? That's what I love the most is that like um, I think, you know, these like little demons and devils were like let's, let's you know, um, uh, take the power away from the queer person and instead they just made me more powerful. Brilliant. <laughs> that is so funny and great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Well, Matthew, is there anything else that you wanted to tell listeners that we haven't touched on so far? Uh, other than um, book me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, <laughs> book me us, for a gig. <laughs> tell us about that. So if listeners want to find out about you a bit more or get in touch, where can they find you? Yeah, so um, you can check me out on my uh, drag Instagram account, which is at Matilda Mercury Queen. 
You can DM me. You can see all my pics and vids. Um, I, I tend to think of myself as like a comedy queen. I think I'm funny. Uh, but, you know, listeners can be the judge of that. And so if you ever want to, um, uh, if you are a allied health worker or psychologist and you want to reach out to me as, as a queer friend, please, um, please do, uh, you know, message me. Um, or alternatively, if you want to book me and see me perform, you can do that as well. On Where are you there. based, Matthew? Oh, good question. So I'm in Melbourne, Victoria, um, but I'll drive for the right fee. Yeah. yeah. Good. It's good to know. <laughs> know your worth. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, very that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Matthew, for coming on. It has been such a pleasure to have you on. And, you know, I'm leaving this episode feeling feeling quite hopeful and inspired. It's, it's just so nice to oh. see someone, you know, not that it's pleasant for you to have gone through the negative experiences, but, you know, really just like come into being you and it's really fantastic to see. Oh, thank you. And uh, I really appreciate that. And thank you for giving me this space and platform to, to be me and to talk about my message. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being an amazing ally. <laughs> no, it's my pleasure. Well, thank you so much, Matthew and listeners. Thank you so much for listening. I'll chuck all those links in the show notes and, and please do reach out to Matthew. Um, they seem genuinely lovely um, and it's been a lovely chat and take care listeners and catch you next time. Bye. Bye.